Hey, welcome to the Couch GM Podcast. You can find the full video version of this podcast on YouTube. You can also find the audio only version across Spotify, Apple Music, whichever audio podcast platform you prefer. Today we have on Will Ortner, who's going to be a regular on the channel. Um, he's a regular on 10, 1080 Sports, the fan a sports radio show in Portland. We have a good conversation about the Seattle Mariners and about baseball in general. If you're a football person, stick towards the end because he goes off about who the teams in college football are to watch in the NFL. And uh, keep your eyes peeled because I think we're going to be starting a Couch GM football channel relatively soon. So also next week, some news. I'm going to be launching a new website. It's going to be thecouchgm.co. And essentially, you'll be able to subscribe. It's a members-only type thing to where I'll have exclusive content on there. I'll have a weekly live stream with members only. We're also getting ready to bring out some merchandise. We got shirts, hats, some other stuff coming. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you for your support. Make sure to hit that like button, and let's get into the podcast. All right, today we have on Will Ordner, our friend, who's a, uh, a regular on 1080 The Fan in Portland. Uh, we're going to talk some Mariners baseball we're going to cover a little bit of what the angels are doing or what they're failing at doing um, and get into <laughs> just more baseball. Maybe we'll talk a little football at the end. So th- thanks hey, again dude. for joining us. Will. all for it. Love being on the show, dude. I always have the best time with you talking baseball. I'm happy to be here, man. I'm happy that the Mariners are winning this time. Right. So, right. Uh, let's keep marching. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's a f- fun time to be talking about the Mariners because they're on a historic tear right now. Um, I don't know if you saw it today, but they set the uh, all-time winningest month in Mariners history with uh, 21 victories, um, which surpasses mm-hmm. six different times that the Mariners had won 20 games in a month. Um, they did it in 95, 97, a couple times in 2001, um, actually like four times in 2001. But yeah, it's just a, a historic tear right now. Right. It's, it's fantastic. And the cool part about it is, you know, I, we had a little Twitter troll moment there where, Oh, is this good? Like someone, please let me know if this is, if this is good for the team, I'm more of a football guy, but they they did it at the most opportune time, right? Like it, they're winning in a time, in a timely fashion. Like you couldn't have picked a better time to have a 21 win month. Then when Houston and Texas seem to be falling, I mean, I think last time I looked in the last 10, Houston was five and five or four and six, something like that. There was a point where Texas was one and nine, one yep. and nine. You made up 10 and a half games in less than a month. I thought there was a chance they might make up those 10 and a half games, but I'm talking like they would take the lead with a week to go, or maybe in those final two series against Texas. And you made all that up in a month. I don't think there's a hotter team in baseball right now. You just got to hope that you can keep that hot hand all the way through September, but really all the way through October. Absolutely. And I saw on Twitter, I forget the actual numbers, but you know, at the beginning of the season, the Tampa Bay Rays were something like 35 and 15 to start the year. They came out of nowhere and they took over the league and everyone was just in complete, complete shock at how hot this team was. But now here come the Mariners. I think they won. They were like, 36 and 14 over the same 50 games stretch since like July 1st. So they were hotter than the Rays were at the beginning of the season. And uh, as you mentioned, couldn't be be a better time heading into the the final month of the season. Right. And it couldn't be with a better group of guys. You know, Um, I I know a lot of people now, they have to be solely on the Rays. You just have to, you can't feel good about this little underdog team after everything that's come out. Let's also talk about the fact that, yeah, the Rays are winning right now, but your best pitcher is done for the year. And your best infielder, he, he's done for the year. So yeah. while they might be right, and he's a piece <laughs> of garbage, and uh, I yeah. hope he rots, allegedly, Man, I'm right? Yeah. But, like, for me, w- when I look at this as the Mariners, I'm a little bit worried, you know, because Julio had to sit out a game. I'm a little bit worried because Ty France seemed to get banged up. A little bit worried about JP. But – those aren't injuries where we're talking, hey, they're going to have to have, you know, Tommy John or it's a broken foot or it's a broken leg or it's a torn this or a torn that. They're little nicks and scrapes. These are things that you sit out a day or two and you're good to go. So you can keep that hot hand and that hot streak. You seem to be peaking at the right time. And other than an Emerson Hancock shoulder issue, you stayed relatively healthy while you're on this hot streak. And, you know, it seems every year there is one team that gets hot at the end. Last year it was the Phillies. They got hot and they made a deep run into the playoffs. 
Why couldn't it be this Mariners team? You are healthy when you need to be healthy. You are peaking when you need to peak. And no team seems to play for each other more than this group. And it really is top to bottom. Um, the top of the line, you know, the JP Crawford has been amazing getting on base, taking over for Julio at the top of the lineup, mm -hmm. you know, mid season when Julio was struggling, struggling a little bit. He's mm -hmm. been an on base machine. I saw a stat like two days ago that JP Crawford since the all-star break was fourth in all of baseball in on base percentage. And so yeah. if, if you can have a guy that's fourth in the league in on base percentage leading you off with Julio too, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a killer combo. Right. Well, and with his speed, I, I don't know if I've ever seen, you know, someone make this big of a leap, you know, not that JP is old in his career, but you know, the complaint about JP was like, dude, the guy's a gold glove winner. He's a fantastic shortstop, but he struggles hitting the ball. Dude, he went to your spot. What is that drive line? Yeah. He was and in drive line this off season. Right. Dude. I'm sending every single one of my guys who's a great infielder, a great outfielder, but can't hit the ball. I'm sending them to drive line now to see this type of growth. The only thing I can compare it to is like Josh Allen in football. Josh Allen had all these accuracy issues. He had the best arm strength. He is just an absolute athlete. But when it came to his accuracy and getting the job done when he needed to, he struggled. He goes to, I believe he went to Palmer. I, I believe he went to Carson Palmer's brother Okay. And that made they made the adjustment on where his arm angle was when he threw, and that made him to what he is now, a Madden cover player and a guy who you're talking about as a possible MVP. JP, he's not to that extent, but he went from a guy where, hey, you have to keep him in the lineup because of his leadership skills and his fielding ability, and if he can get on base every once in a while, you're happy with him, to he's one of the best leadoffs in baseball right now. Absolutely. And uh, Seattle Times, Larry Stone, I listened to their podcast a couple weeks ago. This was before Julio went absolutely insane. But yeah. he was talking about how maybe J.P. Crawford deserves some MVP votes because of how valuable he's been for the Mariners team. Looking at a few more stats for J.P., this year he's batting .268. Um, he has a .386 on-base percentage and .809 OPS, which would be career highs. Uh, Crawford ranks second in the American League and walks behind Shohei and third in on-base percentage behind Shohei and Yanni Diaz. So to have a guy that's, you know, played the defense, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. that, that came in at the top of the lineup and is just producing like he is, he's been extremely valuable. And before Julio got to where he is today, you know, one mm -hmm. of the most valuable players on the team. Yeah, no, 100%. And I, I, I'm not going to go totally into the JP because my I think Julio deserves MVP votes. And I think if if... I think if Julio can keep going at the way that he is, I don't see why he doesn't get MVP votes, especially with like, what's going to happen with Shohei? Is Shohei going to go out and does he need to have the surgery, you know, and does he even want to pitch again? Cause if he doesn't want to pitch again, then Shohei, who cares? Just keep batting. And then there's no way that Julio gets it. Shohei's just been that incredible all year. But if Shohei does shut it down for the year, why couldn't it be Julio? For him to come on as strong as he has the last month, if he can keep even 80% of that up, he has to be in the conversation, not just because of how well he's played, but because of how well he's pushed his team. I think when you look at like pure X factors, that's where I throw JP in, or JP is the MVP of the team because of his leadership on the back end. Uh, but you've got, you've got guys where I, I'm just incredibly impressed. Cal Raleigh's another dude where when stuff was going wrong, he had the balls to actually go up to guys and be like, you are playing like ass. You need to figure <laughs> out what you're doing. You're not playing well. We have to fix, fix this. We have to come together. And sometimes you need that guy on your team where he calls you out and he calls you to the carpet on your mistakes. Cal Raleigh this year has shot up my leaderboard of favorite Mariners just because of not only has he continued to play at a very good pace, honestly, one of the best paces for a Mariners catcher ever, right? But he's actually willing to step up and make the hard comments when he needs to. JP is almost like the fun mom and Cal Raleigh's the angry dad. But <laughs> when, when Cal comes down on you, you, you make the change and then JP's there to pick you back up and build that confidence back. It works perfect for him. Do you recall the uh, actual scenario to where Cal went up and talked to someone? 
I want to say, didn't he call it? I know he said a couple things with Jen Mueller on Root Sports where okay. he was saying, hey, we're not playing well enough right now. Yeah, I, I do want to say there was a player only meeting or a player o- manager only meeting that I'd remembered seeing some stuff on Twitter about from, I believe I saw it from Divish or maybe I saw it from Fan, but I remember seeing it on Twitter. And right around that time is when the Mariners started to play better. And to me, that just shows like, hey, you got to have that guy who's not afraid to be an ass. And Cal isn't afraid to be an ass, but he does it in the right way. He doesn't do it in a way that blows up the clubhouse. He does it in a way of, you need to play better. This is the standard. Let's reach the standard together. Absolutely. And it reminds me of uh, when Logan and Cal were coming up through the minor leagues. You know, Logan and Cal got into it a bit because they both care so much about the game and getting better. Right. And you know, one of them has an opinion and they're both kind of hard headed about it, but in a good way to where it's, you know, it creates that bond and really Mm -hmm. gets the team going in a positive light. Uh, Cal Raleigh leads all MLB catchers this year in home runs. And I saw a crazy stat the other day. This is from eight days ago. The Mm -hmm. most home runs by a switch hitters since 2002. Number one is Anthony Santander. Number two is Cal Raleigh. Three is Francisco Lindor, four is Jose Ramirez, and five is Brian Reynolds. I mean, that's a stacked class of guys, and that's Cal Raleigh is, is, in the, is in the top of the you know that group. That, that's amazing. Oh, dude! Well, he's been fantastic. I, I found it. It's after it's after they lost to the Nats. He goes, "We're just not a good baseball team right now." Yeah, yeah. That's, that's June twenty seventh, and that was when they went on their first little run. And I and I know I'll have to go and and find more. Um, but he just seems like, like you said, man, he is a fantastic player and he's, he's giving you a lot of production in a position that the Mariners didn't get a lot of production out of for years. I mean, there was a point in time where I was like, well, we got to keep Mike Zanino. He hits 20 home (laughs) runs. It's like, yeah, but for every home run he hits, he strikes out five other times, you know? Um, now you got Tom Murphy also right there. Right, right. So you have, you have this good group and he, Murphy's a guy that, you know, he needs to get more DH time, I think, or, or when he is getting time, let Cal DH a little bit more and get some rest on the knees for this long haul that you're about to go on. But shoot, man, it, it, it's just a, it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of fun to see a team click at the exact right moment. Yeah. And so they're eight and two, their last 10 Houston is seven and three, their last 10 Texas is three and seven, their last 10 um, before they got the save yesterday, they had the Texas Rangers had blown more saves than they had converted saves. I think they had blown 26 saves and they converted 25 saves. You hate to see it. <laughs> you just hate to see it. You just hate to see that. <laughs> Come I on feel all this. Man. I feel horrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, the final 10 games of the year are going to come down to it's three at the Rangers, then three at the Astros or three against the Astros at home. And then mm-hmm. four against the Rangers at home. So that's that's going to be an insane, you know, last ten days. Yeah, it's 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 literally make or break for you, and I actually think it's beautiful that way though because you know it's going to be a close race to the end for whoever's going to be in the AL West position and whoever's going to be in that you know second and third wild card spot. But I also think it's it's perfect because you have all these issues. Like I remember, and again, I'm relating it a little bit apples to oranges, but. It is sports going into the postseason of the Indianapolis Colts all the time would dominate the regular season when Peyton Manning was there. They'd go 13 and three. And the last game, they would sit out all their starters. Then they'd get a bye. Then they'd play their next game and they would all be rusty and they wouldn't know how to crank it up that extra notch for the postseason. Baseball is the same way. So sometimes it's better to be fighting tooth and nail the entire time. So that way, when you finally do get into the postseason, it's like, hey, we've already been playing this way we know how to win these games and we're going to keep winning these games because it's what we had to do the last 10 games of our season right (coughs) yeah and uh we haven't talked since the trade deadline what did you think initially of the uh the mariners trade with the diamondbacks well i think i thought what everyone else kind of thought of you're selling high on paul seawald but you you're not really making a change or a difference, right? Like you went out and you got some young guys, so you're building towards the future, but you didn't really make a decision on, 
hey, we're selling and we're getting a bunch of guys for the future, or we're buying guys like the Angels did and we're going to try and win, we're going to try and win right now. It seemed like a lateral move. It was something that I was kind of met on, you know, like it sucks that Seawald's gone, but that's you putting your trust into Brash and into Munoz that those two can now take over that role in, uh, you know, Brash stepping into Munoz's spot and Munoz stepping into Seawald's spot. And then it turns out, like, after you give a couple games to Rojas, Rojas is the best second baseman you've had in a very, very long time. And that it, it's a good thing that DePoto sat on it and said, no, I'm going to wait until I get Rojas. Because after the first week, I'm with every other Mariner fan. Like, why did we wait for this guy? He's not any better than Wong or Caballero. And then it turns out, like, the dude has been a, a functional piece, right? He's been fantastic. And then Kinzone, dude, he is awesome. And he's fit into this role of, you got to make sure he plays every two to three days. Now, is he necessarily going to be a starter? I don't know. I don't know how you use that outfield position once Kelnick gets back and you got Marlowe there and you got Kinzone. I mean, shoot, even more or Haggerty can go and play that position. It might turn into kind of a rotation of, you know, let's ride whoever's the hot hand, who's batting the best. But I'll tell you what, man, I, I love Kinzone. He's gone out and made some great plays in the outfield. And then he's had some timely hitting as well. So it's weird. You you look at this move and you kind of go, man, I don't know how I feel about that. And then they've been some of the at least key role players and why you've gone on this run. Yeah, absolutely. Like you mentioned, selling high on Seawald, 33-year-old 30, reliever, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. one and, and a half years left of control. I hadn't, I hadn't heard of Dominic Hanzone until the trade happened. Right. Um, and then you go to his stat sheet and he tore it up you know, throughout college, throughout the different minor league levels. And then Mm -hmm. when we traded for him, he had only played 15 games with the diamondbacks and he was, he was batting, you know, fifth right in the middle of the order for a Mm -hmm. team that had a better record than the Mariners did that were Mm -hmm. competing for the, you know, top in the AL or NL West. So, you know, they obviously, obviously saw something in him. And then, so, I mean, the, the potential is completely there. And then Josh Rojas, as you mentioned, um, with the Diamondbacks, he didn't hit hit a single home run all year through 216 plate appearances. Now through uh, 67 plate appearances with the Mariners, he's got three bombs. He's got an 819 OPS, mm-hmm. which is uh, an OPS 30% above league average. And yeah. in, a, in an interview, he was talking about it just took a couple changes with the hitting coach that mm-hmm. uh, with the Mariners that, you know, this might have been the move that was needed. He just made an adjustment is able to elevate it to the pull side easier, which is giving Mm -hmm. him that easy power. So yeah, some sneaky, another, another sneaky move by DePoto. You don't know what you get until, you know, we're a couple seasons into it, but looking good so far. It's it's a little bit of that, that money ball move. And, And I know fans get frustrated all the time about, you know, ownership and not being willing to spend, right? At the beginning of the year, it's like, of course the Rangers are doing well. They went out and paid a lot of money for good players, and we didn't. And we can complain and we can moan about it, but at the end of the day, a guy like DePoto, his job is to find winners, whatever your situation is. And I think at this point, he's earned the benefit of the doubt from more fans specifically and from me, where it's like he has gone out and he has done – everything that he's needed to do in a money ball type situation where he is going to find that guy, so to speak on the trash heap, and he's going to pick him up and he's going to plug him into the system because he thinks he's going to work. And yes, I would love for owners to start spending more money on quality players, but if they're not going to do that, then it's on DePoto to continue to succeed this way. And fans have to start giving him that benefit of the doubt and that trust of, you have proven that you can do this time and time again. I'm going to trust you and I will sit back and I will wait and see what you can do. And I, I'm glad that fans are starting to come around to that. Cause there was a point where people were saying to get him out. You gotta and, let Jerry cook. Right. It's, it's a good thing that we, we let him cook. Not no more Russ cooking. Let, let DePoto cook. Well, thankfully Russ is cooking on the Broncos and uh, he's not on our team. <laughs> Yeah, keep uh keep cooking like I cook horribly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um speaking of okay, so speaking of, you know, management, general managers, mm. good good management. Let's talk about some bad management. 
did you did you see what happened with the angels specifically yesterday yeah so i the one that sticks out to me is giolito um you just traded for this guy it is the ultimate the minute i saw the the drop in the waiver uh ads of these four players from the angels i immediately went oh this is the dude who's playing fantasy football and there's two weeks left and he's <laughs> two and eight and he's like you know what i'm gonna lose anyways so i want to cause havoc and i'm gonna drop all my best players to see who picks them up on the waiver wire and can this affect people getting into the playoffs or getting out of the playoffs instead of me doing what I'm supposed to do and try and win with the pieces that I've been allotted. It's so clearly a, well, I lost. F it. Get rid of these guys. We're not getting show. Hey, we're going to rebuild. And you just traded away your entire farm system to get these guys. It's right. hilarious. I hate, you hate to see it. You hate to see it happen to Anaheim. <laughs> It's you horrible. just hate to see it. <laughs> it's I think it was somewhere around July 28th when the Angels officially took Shohei off of, off of the market. They said, we're not going to trade him. We're going to go for it. At the time, they were six games back in the division. They were four games back at the wild card. They then decided to trade for Lucas Giolito and Ronaldo Reyna- Lopez from the White Sox, which on the surface level, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, good for them. They're going for it, whatever. They gave up their number two and number three overall prospects to get Giolito and Ronaldo Lopez. And now they also traded for Randall Gritchick and CJ Krohn from the Rockies. They gave up a, a lower tier prospect for them. But now here we are just over a month later, and they're literally giving up Giolito, Ronaldo Lopez. Um, let me see here. Randall Gritchick, Hunter Renfro. Yeah. And, and all they get in return is salary re- relief. So it's like they don't get any prospects. They don't get any benefit. It's like, why, why don't you just keep these guys, Make a see if you can make a push. I know that Shohei's got a UCL that's gone, so that takes away a pitcher. You got Mike Trout that's still injured. That takes away, I mean, yeah. they obviously have no shot, but really, if you're a, a, a GM that's looking for your franchise's future, like you got to trade Shohei at the deadline, get the, the haul that you could try to get. Of course, it's not going to be like a haul that the – the uh, nationals got for Juan Soto last year mm-hmm. because it was going to be a year and a half of Juan Soto plus, you know, half a year of Josh Bell versus just a half year of Shohei. But if you can get anything to the angels at the start of the year, were 28th overall with their farm system. And then they give up their number two and the number three overall prospects. And now you don't have Shohei next year because you're not going to sign him. No. It's like they're in a death spiral right now. Well, it's just, what are you doing? It's it's a bad decision followed by a bad decision. Now, at the time when they made those moves, I didn't think they were bad moves at all. In fact, I was a little upset that the Mariners didn't make them. So I need to, you know, pump my brakes and listen to myself a little bit here. Like, don't start freaking out just because it's an <laughs> e-jerk reaction. But I like that they actually went all in. You know, at, at some point, it shows that you at least wanted to try. The problem is, you tried to do it way, way too late. You should have been making moves like this two and three years ago. That way, exactly. you showed Shohei you can be do, you'd been trying to win the entire time. I wonder, too, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I feel like it, gets, it got to a point where there was no reason to trade Shohei at the trade deadline because they knew how like little value they would get in return. Before the UCL injury, we're talking about Shohei being – three quarters of a billion dollars worth of money in that next contract. But if you know that if you trade him, you're only getting him for less than half a year. Why would I give up a bunch of guys when I know if I'm not LA, New York, or Seattle, you're probably not going to get him to sign in free agency. So you're not going to give up that many picks. The beauty of Soto is you can give, give up all these picks and you know, you have them for at least a couple of years. So I wonder if it got to a point where they start making calls and teams are going, dude, I'm not trading for that guy. I'll call you. I'll call him directly or I'll call his agent directly here in December. I'm not dealing with you guys. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's one of those things to where, you know, maybe their asking price was too high. They were waiting out (coughs) too much, you know, like a team like the Orioles that had such a, that has such a stacked farm system. They could have Mm -hmm. done something like that to really take them over the top. Um, But you know, they're not going to pay their owners are so dang cheap. Yeah. You know, no, that, yeah. that's, that's, that's the other issue when it comes down to it. Like I think Seattle would be the perfect place for Shohei. I'm biased. And I think you could probably <laughs> get him 
I wouldn't say at a discount, but at definitely a lesser rate. He's already come out and said that he loves Seattle. He's already come out and talked about how much he loves Ichiro and how much he wants to be around a group of winners. And that's clearly what this team is. But, you know, that being, that being said, as a Seattle fan, it's like, why would you trade to, to get him? You're going to have to trade the farm. Why would you trade yeah. the farm to only guarantee a half a year? <clears throat> and then when you go to sign him again in free agency, he could use those things as being like, well, I would have loved to play with, you know, say you trade away a Jared Kelnick or, you know, whoever you want to throw in there. He might then look at it and go, well, I want to play with Jared and I want to play with Marlo and I want to play with these guys and you trade him away. So why would I come back and play here? I don't think you guys have what it takes. Whereas if you do what the Mariners did, you can at least now make the logical argument of, well, if the ownership is willing to shell out the money, we might get him. So I think that really just played a role in his trade value. If this is two and three years ago and they're now talking for a trade, then yeah, it's, hey, let's give him the farm. Let's give the Angels everything right. we got. He's only there for half a year and then you've got no guarantees. I'm not giving up squat. <laughs> yeah, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, how his value is affected with that UCL. And if I'm Shohei, it's like, I'm not putting on another Angels uniform. I'm finding the closest knife available and starting my recovery tomorrow to try to get healthy, to, right. to pitch as soon as possible. Because um, I did a video on, you know, why the Angels should have traded Shohei. And mm -hmm. just looking at the comparisons of who he actually is as a, as a player is insane. He's some combination of Corbin Burns and Mookie Betts. It's it's like a top five arm and a top five hit, hitter in the same in the same guy it's well i mean you can't shoot, even compare dude. him to babe ruth i mean he he's the best we've ever seen as far as a two-way player i mean he's got an mvp and he has had multiple votes for a cy young like he really is that guy but i do wonder now this is your second tommy john surgery do teams tell him to pick one or the other the other part that's crazy is he might have cost himself 200 million dollars and he'll still probably sign for 400 <laughs> yeah how insane is that if he never picks up the ball and pitches again he is not worth 600 million to 700 million dollars which is a number that people were throwing out which to be honest with you i think are legitimate like i think it's legitimate to pay that much for him that's how good he was but if he's not going to pitch then he isn't worth you know 600 million but I'd still make the argument based on the amount of money that other top bats are getting, other top MVP type players are getting. He's worth $400 million. Yeah. I mean, and, and like, I'm sure you've heard, I mean, just the jury in, in the Jersey sales sales that oh, he would dude. sell in the first year. It's like, he can make up majority of that contract pretty, pretty quickly. You, you get an entire country that just yeah. beloves him and will buy all of his merchandise, all of his gear. And, and the beauty of it, and part of the reason why he always talked about wanting to be in Seattle, LA, or New York is he can kind of hide. If he's in, you know, Milwaukee, everyone knows who he is. <laughs> you know, if he's in Cincinnati, everyone knows, knows who Shohei is. But in these cities where, you know, there's a bigger population, specifically a bigger Asian American population, he's going to be able to hide a little bit, or he's going to have one of those things where people go, Oh, Hey, that's cool. That's Shohei. I just saw Shohei. That's like, that's dope. <laughs> As opposed to people sitting outside of his restaurant, like he's Taylor Swift or Beyonce. <laughs> I mean, I, and I, I know people who went to Japan that are saying they do live cut-ins. They stop showing the news to watch him pat back. Oh, How man. insane is that? Yeah. So he he's worth every penny. He really yeah. is. Absolutely. Yeah, it'll be it'll be crazy to see what happens. Um, and then seeing what else they can do this offseason to um, you know, just take that next step forward. We'll see how they do the rest of this year. A few other stats. I'm looking at this stat sheet for the Mariners real quick. Mm -hmm. Um, so inside the numbers, the Mariners have 12 hitters with at least 50 plate appearances and an OPS plus of at least a hundred, which is most in the majors, which is just an insane stat to me because the first up until July, the Mariners were about 23rd in major league baseball and OPS on base plus slugging. 
So they weren't getting on base a ton. And when they were getting their hits, they weren't doing a ton of damage. So just not good overall. Mm -hmm. And now they come out and their entire lineup top to bottom is just insane. And now they have 12 guys with at least 50 plate appearances and an OPS plus of at least a hundred. So 12 guys that are at least a league average bat. Whereas before they were 23rd in the league. So right. That just kind of speaks to how much of a, a switch has been flipped. Huge jumps. And then, and you're also looking at timely hitting too. Cause you know, you, you look at the RBI numbers, you got three guys in the eighties in RBI. Yeah. That's yeah. huge. You have what? A little less than 30 games left on the year. You've got a you've got a month left of, of baseball. So when I look at that, you've got three guys with legitimate potential to be ninety to a hundred RBI guys early on a, in the that's year. Lock, I think. Right, and early on in the year, you were struggling when it came to having that timely hitting. And I don't want to call it like a clutch factor, but it it seems like that that switch got flipped, and it came back to where we were expecting this Mariners team to be, you know, the last two years where it just seemed like every time there was a big moment and you needed a key hit, it didn't matter who was at the plate. They found a way to get that hit. You're seeing that more and more, you know, you're not having too many one to zero Kirby losses only on Felix Knight, but that's just because they were honoring King Felix. Right. (laughs) So it's stuff like that, that you love to see. I mean, shoot today, they won five to four against the A's. That's a game that, in June, I would have probably bet they lost because they'd have the same amount of hits. They just wouldn't get those hits when guys were on base or when guys were in scoring position. And now they seem to have made that switch. It's the biggest reason they've made the jump that they have. It's insane. Yeah, and for whatever reason, you know, every time I was watching the game, I felt like they were doing awful with runners in scoring position. But then, and it is also because of this recent stretch, I I had seen like a month ago that the Mariners had a pretty high average compared to the league with runners in scoring position, which is kind of shocking. Um, But then let me see here. So far on the year, it's like you got Julio Rodriguez with runners in scoring position all year. He's batting 317. Teoscar Hernandez, 308. Suarez, 284. And then, yeah, as you mentioned, you got, um, let's see here. It's so fantastic. You got Julio with 87 RBIs, Suarez with 83, Teoscar with 81. And we talk about how hot Julio's been. Teoscar Hernandez has been his best self, you know, in in a Mariners uniform. So up and He's the guy. This is the guy you traded for. Exactly. Early on in the year when he was having those big strikeout games, he was striking out two or three times. It was, oh, my God, it's Jesse Winker (laughs) 2.0. And it's basically been about maybe a little bit before the All-Star break, but right around the All-Star break where it's finally – This is the guy we were excited about. This is the guy we traded for. And he's a guy now that I want up in clutch moments. I remember, you know, like I'm talking about in April and in May, he'd come up to bat and it's, ah, crap, just get it in play. Now it's, please get it to Teoscar. Please find a way (laughs) for him to be up with runners in scoring position. Because something good is always going to happen, it seems like. It's fantastic. So in August... Um, let's see here. <coughs> Mariners had a uh, 373 on base percentage, a 496 slugging, 870 OPS. The the m- most recent time that they had an OPS of at least 850 in a counter month was in May 2003. And what I what I love is that 2003. These, com- these comparisons now, they're all being compared to 2003, 2001. It's like yeah. the last time that they were an elite team is mm-hmm. is what they're being compared to now, and that's really. That's what we expected at the beginning of the season, and it just took some time for it all to click. So the pitching has been there all year. The offense has come around. Now they're essentially a juggernaut. Right, right. Which, I mean, that's that's what everyone who was uh, on the Mariners bandwagon was saying was, hey, be patient. They'll eventually figure it out. The other thing that I love about it is they are young. It almost looks like last year, you were a year early, is really what it looks like to me because – when you go up and down this team, you go up and down this roster, Julio's young. Gino and Teoscar, they're older, but they're performing at a great level. Cal Raleigh's young. JP is relatively young. Jose Caballero is young. He's been fantastic for you. When Kelnick was in and healthy, he he's young. Kinzone has been awesome for you. He's young. Rojas, relatively young. 
you know, so you have a bunch of guys, not just at the plate, but pitching. I mean, shoot, your oldest guy is 31, 32 yeah. on the mound. So, <laughs> and he's contending for a Cy Young. Right. So all your pitching is young and it's been fantastic. And a good chunk of your batters are young. This is just going to keep getting better and better and better. So now it's how do you replace these older guys when they decide to move on or when you decide to move on from them? And how do you replace them? Who do you go out and get? Do you continue to keep building young players and finding those, you know, special pieces off the trash heap? Or do we eventually convince ownership to go make a big swing? Because I I really do think that could be the difference in, I don't want to say winning multiple World Series, but for sure putting yourself in a position to win one. And what might be interesting is, um, you know, I was talking with Ryan Dibish, Seattle Times, and he was talking about how, you know, whether it's true or not, there's the conception that it's tough for people to hit or players to hit in Seattle. And so it's hard for them to sign hitters to big contracts or Mm -hmm. big names to contracts. You know, I made the argument, argument with him that it seemed like, you know, visiting teams had no problem coming in and whooping on the Mariners in Seattle, hitting home runs, and it didn't affect them, but it's more of like a mindset. You know, people mm-hmm. hear that it's hard to hit. Their their friends telling them, hey, it's hard to hit there, so then they end up not signing there. So with the Mariners, what they have to do is they have to develop the, the pitching. They can sign the big-name pitchers because they know that it's a pitcher-friendly park. It'll play mm-hmm. to their talents. So you bring up this young talent and starting pitching, they might see, you know, conversations in the offseason again to where, is Logan Gilbert in the mix again or a Bryce Miller, Brian Wu, so that you can mm. trade one of those young guys for a young controllable bat and then sign like a Blake Snell in the off season type thing. So it's, a, it's like, I mean, it's kind of 4d chess that you have to play when you're running an organization and specifically, you know, what your organization is. So. hundred yeah. percent. I mean, for me personally, at this point, I'd rather keep all the young arms. Because yeah. when, when you look at this starting rotation, you're it's probably going to have, you're going to have three, no, sorry, four. You're going to have four, four guys with 10 plus wins. Miller got, uh, I think he got nine today. So he just needs one more. Gilbert already has 12. Kirby has 10 and he really should have 12 to 14. And then Castillo's got 11. So you're going to have multiple pitchers for almost your entire starting pitching staff with double-digit wins. Oh, and by the way, Robbie Ray got hurt after his second outing of the year. Marco Gonzalez got hurt right away. So two of your top five guys at the start of the year got hurt and didn't play. So you're going with two young guns who have managed to push themselves into that double digits. And this is Kirby's first full year with the team. Right. It's only Logan's second, third. So yep. for me, I almost want to just hold on to him. Like, let's for start sure. paying him. Let's go the Atlanta Braves route of we're going to overpay for you now, but we're going to trust that you're going to keep building and keep winning. And that's going to lead to it looking like Acuna's deal later on. You know, maybe not to that extreme because Acuna is probably going to be a multiple <laughs> time MVP in the league. But similar idea of let's pay overpay when they're young. And you look back at this in five years and you go, we got Gilbert for a hundred million. What a steal. You know, we got Kirby for 120. That's incredible. (laughs) So that's where I would look next instead of maybe trading for pitching, maybe overpaying a little bit for the young guys, but you know, shoot, I would, uh, I would never complain if a Garrett Cole type ended up trying to get to Seattle or, you know, someone like that. Yeah, and one one of the other stats is it's insane how good the Mariners have been at whip, walks it mm-hmm. walks plus hits divided by innings pitched. Um, yeah. The Mariners have three pitchers who rank in the top five in whip in the major leagues. Luis Castillo has a one whip. He allows one batter on base per inning that he pitches, whether it's via hit or walk. George Kirby is second with a 1.03. Logan Gilbert is fifth with a 1.05. And if Bryce Miller qualified in innings, he would be fourth with something like a 1.04 whip. So, yeah. you know, the the Mariners mantra is dominate the zone. And that's exactly what they do. They do not waste pitches. They get ahead of guys. They put them away and they're all pumping 95 plus with 
incredible spin and i'll have to send you the graphic or put it on the screen but they did a segment on mlb network and they showed the different arm slots of all the different mariners starting pitchers and mm -hmm. you know gilbert's like straight over the top then i think it's castillo next and then or bryce miller and then castillo and it like it starts up here and then all of them kind of go down here and brian Wu's like mm -hmm. coming out like almost out like a sidearm side arm. almost yeah so it, it's a different look from every guy and they also throw like the most fastballs in in the league so yeah well shoot castillo's like last start or two starts ago he finished the game with like 40 <laughs> straight fastballs yeah, the yeah. Damn pitch calm broke and it didn't change anything it was like it here it is try to hit it yes dude and Four that's seam, fantastic two yeah right that's the and that's what makes this team so great but that's also what's going to make this team have the ability to win a championship right we've seen that hitting it can take a while for it to figure out but it seems like in this league you either got it or you don't as a pitcher and that can really change year to year so that's why it can be scary at times to overpay for some of these guys and maybe i'm a little over my skis with some of them but at the same time if you want to win a a world series Imagine having to go against Gilbert, Kirby, Castillo in whichever order the Mariners want to bring them out in. Oh, if you hit one of them and you get to one of them early, then you got to go against Wu or Miller. Then you're going against this bullpen. You know, sacito has been fantastic. Thornton's been pretty good. I Game like Spire. Weaver. Spire. Then you got to go up against Brash and Munoz, who I know they've been a little shaky as of late, but at the same time, when you've needed them most, they haven't been like the Avatar and Vanish. They've been there for you, and they've dominated. Like, this is a, a team where last year, you know, and um, in the years previous, you can win a game with this pitching staff where you have three or four guys that pitch, and you only give up two runs. You can, yeah. you can win a World Series with this team. You can win games and multiple games in the playoffs where your, your bats might not show up as well as they need to because of how dominant and how unique this pitching staff is. And, and uh, you mentioned Munoz for a second. Here's one stat. So in uh, 14 appearances in August, he has uh, nine saves, which leads the American League. I'm trying to find the actual ERA here. Let me see. Um, but, I mean, I, I spoke with him last time I was up there, and mm. he was talking about how he just wanted to throw more fastballs. Because, yeah. you know, and I was and I was noticing it is the batters are just sitting on the slider because he was throwing the slider like 60, 65 percent of the time. Mm -hmm. He's got the elite fastball, but if he's throwing his slider every time, they could sit back on it and, that, and just wait for that pitch to, to hit on. So since mm -hmm. moving to, you know, throwing the fastball more, let's see here. As I mentioned, nine saves, like 14 innings pitch. He's got 20 strikeouts, nine saves, um, ERA of 1.92. So. He's becoming that, you know, saves guy that that we're needing at this point. So Right. That that lockdown guy. And and I you know what? I I do at times love the Mariano Mariano Rivera type closer, you know, the Hoffman type closer, Gagne type closer, where it doesn't matter, it's the ninth inning, they're going in. Yeah. But I am coming around to the situational closer of hey you know, in the seventh, we're actually going to face their best hitters. So if we throw Munoz here, we can throw Brash against the second best. And then we can have, you know, take your pick between uh, Spear, Thornton, Sacido, you know, whoever it seems like in this bullpen. And they might get the, the quote unquote save, but you had your number one guy go up against their number one guys. And I right. almost like exactly. that more. And it, it, it confuses me at times to why I thought in such an old school way of like, nope, you have your, your seventh inning guy, you have your setup guy and you have your closer. I almost like the way service has been doing it. And, you know, no one's going to lead the league in saves. That's just not how it works if you do it this way, but it sets you up to win. If you trust your number one against their number one. Absolutely. Put your best guys against their best guys. Cause that's, you know, the moment's not always in the ninth inning. Sometimes it's in the seventh or in the eighth right. inning to where it's like you're down by – you're up by one. Now's the time. Right. You're up by one. You throw your, you know, number four, number five guy, and they give up two runs. You don't even get to your number one guy. I'd rather go out, you know, on my shield, so to speak, of, well, you know what? They got to Munoz today. It is what it is. We gave it our best shot. So let me ask you this. Um, mm -hmm. So Munoz had – this is his fourth year. Before this month, 
how many saves do you think he had in his career over three years? He had oh. pitched, sorry, two full years, about uh, 88 innings pitched. Yeah, I I know. I'm, so I'm a little, I'm cheating a little bit. I know okay. I have the stats up for this year. So I know he's at 11 this year. I would say he's not more than 65. I, I wouldn't think. I total would saves. think because even total saves. Yeah. Because I mean, shoot, even last year and even a chunk of this year, it seemed like he was the one facing the number ones. And a lot of times that was him facing the, you know, the three, four hitter, three, four, five hitter, you know, one, two, three hitters in the seventh and eighth inning. Before this month, he had nine. He had nine? He has 15 saves now in, in his career. Holy crap. Crap. Which, I mean, the first time I, you know, I looked like a month ago when I was last up there and that number just shocked me because in it, the amount of holds that I'm trying to find the holds that he has, which is obviously a really high number of holds. But uh, the fact that he only had like nine saves in his entire career just right. blew my mind. I would, I would have thought you told me he had two full seasons and then basically like uh, th- three fourths of this season. And, you know, a half of the other, I would have thought the two full seasons, he would have been somewhere right around 15 to 20 in each. And then this year he's, you know, he's right at 11. I would have thought the other year he was probably around that number. Um, I just wanted to give him a little more for the benefit of the doubt. That's incredible. (laughs) Just to clarify. Yeah. He came up with the Padres 22 games. So it wasn't a full year. And then uh, 2022 was his only full year because he was injured in 2021. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's so crazy. That, yeah, especially for a guy who five years ago would have been a closer for the last two years and would have only pitched in the ninth inning. He, you know, a lot of people compare him to Edwin Diaz, which makes sense, right? He came in right around the same time that you got rid of Diaz. Diaz was your closer. And in New York, he was awesome last year. So you have to kind of compare the two of them. But, shoot, at, at times, I, I think I'd rather have Munoz because there's an unselfish nature to a guy who says, dude, I don't need the saves. I don't need to be the ninth inning guy. I want to be the guy going up against against the top brass. I want to go up against Trout. I want to go up against, you know, Simeon. I want to go against Seager. I want to go against these guys. Those are the guys I want to attack. I want to attack Altuve, Jordan Alvarez. Um, and, and that just makes him go up and up in my book. He's also, what, 23? Yeah. He's only going to get better. Yeah. He's only going to get better. Speaking, speaking of young guys, your best two pitchers in your bullpen are under 25. Yeah. It's beautiful. And then it's, I mean, they, they really have a pitching lab pitching factory and I want to make a video on it at some point, but Mm -hmm. just the ability that they're able to bring in these no name guys that were DFA would by other teams that were just waiver pickups or no name trades in the off season and turn them into essentially elite bullpen arms. I mean, Justin mm-hmm. Topa, let me pull up his stat. Uh, oh, he's been right? fantastic. Justin Topa has not allowed an earned run over his last 17 outings since July 24th, going 2-1 and one with eight holds, a zero ERA, over 15 innings pitched, three walks, 14 strikeouts. Opponent's batting average is 140. Um, and then even, even dating back to his last 27 appearances, He's had a 0.39 ERA opponents with a 181 batting average. I mean, it's he's, just he's ridiculous. Leading your team, he's leading your team in holds. Yeah, <laughs> man. Out, out of a guy that on most teams is like, well, I guess, you know, when guys need a break, this is when we throw him in. And now he's a big deal for you. I mean, and Matt I was Brash. Yeah. Sorry, Matt Brash. Yeah. Matt Brash was a starting pitcher last year. He was your yeah. fifth man in the rotation. And you turn. I forget that sometimes. To, right. <laughs> Because he was the guy that everyone was talking about, not Kirby. Right, it was right, Brash. Right. Brash was supposed to be the guy. And then you send him down to AAA and <laughs> you, you help him learn how to be basically your, your number two relief arm. He's second on your team and holds with 18. He now has, you know, multiple saves. He's got four on the year. But again, he is turning into, if you have Munoz and him, he goes up, he's the number two guy. But if Munoz isn't there or you want to give Munoz an extra, you know, day of rest, you use Brash and you can trust him to be the number one guy against their number ones. So to 
to change a guy from a starting pitcher's mindset to you're going to go out there and you're going to face three batters and you've got, you know, 20, 25 pitches to get through an inning, maybe an inning and two thirds at the most and turn this guy in less than a year, basically into being a top bullpen arm. It's unbelievable. And I saw a Twitter uh, poll the other day that was, you know, asking um, which which pitching staff or starting pitching rotation in the playoffs would be the filthiest or the hardest to hit. And I said, hands down, it has to be the Mariners because, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. you got Castillo, Kirby, Gilbert, and then as you just mentioned, you know, telling Brash to just throw to three guy ga- or uh, three outs. If you told Bryce mm-hmm. Miller or Brian Wu to just throw go two innings, they're already you know, upper nineties, if they go to right. they're sit- sitting a hundred and just tearing guys apart. So it's going to be a lot of fun to see what happens the next, the last month that last, you know, 10 days is going to be insane. And then I'm sure we'll see them playing deep into October. So really yeah, excited to right. see what happens there. It's, it's time to back up your word early on in the yep. year. I mean, shoot before the season started and it became a meme. You did the, we're going for it all. And everyone was making fun of it. Well, now it actually seems like you you really do have a shot to go for it all. I really think the X factor, though, with this team is as much as we're bragging about how well they're doing and the youth that they have and, um, you know, how that's going to lead to future success, how does that youth hold up in, in postseason play? I mean, we've seen Gilbert go out, and Gilbert was fantastic. We've seen Ger- Kirby go out, and he was fantastic. Can you be fantastic again? Can Munoz and Brash – go out and be their dominant selves, right? Uh, he did, Brash did fantastic last year in the postseason. Can he do it again? Can Munoz do it again? Um, and then from a, from a hitting aspect, can those young guys, can zone Rojas, shoot even Julio to a degree, even Rowley to a degree, Caballero, can those guys get the job done, right? Can they stay hot? Can they push through the big lights, something that, They've gotten to get a little bit of a taste of, but they really haven't for a deep playoff run. Absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun to see. Um, we got a few yeah, minutes left. Do you want to get into football real quick? Dude, I'd love to. I know I'm, you're I've you're already a got, uh, I've got I've got my college football bets cooking. I've got my NFL stuff going. I can't wait, dude. I haven't, t- I I haven't looked at football basically at all, so – Give me a rundown. What teams are there to watch in college football? Like, you know, is it going to be Alabama again? Or or what teams are out there? Especially with right. – this is the last year where things are normal before the Pac-12 is gone. That's this. That's really sad. Right. And it, it's one of the more depressing things ever for me as a football guy. It's so regional-based, right? The SEC plays a brand of football. The Big Ten plays a – really crappy brand of football um (laughs) not named ohio state uh (laughs) acc plays their own brand pac-12 and big 12 play their own brands and that was some of the beauty of it if i tuned into a nine o'clock iowa versus you know northwestern game i knew it was going to be three yards in a cloud of dust it's going to be low scoring (laughs) but that might be what i'm into if i'm tuning into the pac-12 late night i know something crazy is going to happen if i turn into the big 12 i know it's going to be a lot of points no defense to this be the last year of that sucks at the same time in a weird way especially for the pac-12 it's the best year for it to happen because the league is so freaking loaded offensively if you're going down the list you have caleb williams returning he is the returning heisman winner that is if you don't know that's basically the best player in college football i i've heard arguments that he's going to be even better Like, he plays the game like you see Patrick Mahomes play it on Sunday. He had a throw in week zero against San Jose State where ball it's a bad snap. He grabs the ball, flat-footed, turns sidearm throw 50 yards on the numbers to his wide receiver, and the guy runs it for a touchdown. You just don't see that type of quarterback play. But then you can make the argument, depending on how certain teams play, he might not have the best statistical year. Last year, he didn't. Michael Penix out at UW – was absolutely fantastic. He was slinging the rock around. He can throw it. He's got Rome Odunze, and he's got Jalen McMillan at wide receiver, two of the best wide receivers in the country, not just in the uh, Pac-12. So he can sling the rock around. At Oregon, you've got all these bodacious Heisman uh, little billboards that are going up. 
They're fantastic. That dude was slinging the rock around. Plus with them where it's different is you have two running backs in Noah Whittington and Bucky Irving that are unbelievable. Last year they beat out multiple guys in the Oregon Duck backfield that were basically penciled in as for sure starters. They, they come in as transfers, beat them out. They set the Pac-12 on fire and they play absolutely fantastic football. Then you go down, well, I guess sideways and maybe a little <laughs> up to Corvallis. They just got the best quarterback prospect they've ever gotten in Aiden Childs. And the only reason that kid's not starting is because you got a former five-star in DJU to be your transfer starter from Clemson. Now, oh, man. did he look fantastic last year? He didn't look like a Clemson quarterback, but if you remember his Notre Dame game, he had a game where the dude threw for 400 yards, and he's the reason that Clemson was even in that football game. That's not even going in to talk about the fact that they have two of the toughest running backs other than Bucky Irving and Noah Whittington in Fennec and in Martinez. You've just got this fantastic brand of football. And that's not even getting into what's going to happen in Colorado with Shader Sanders and with uh, Travis Hunter. How's that team going to look? WSU, your guys, Connor. I mean, Ward was awesome last year. He played extremely well, and he's only going to keep building. Dickert is a fantastic coach, I believe, and he's going to keep building that program. You know, UCLA, it's Chip Kelly. They're not going to be as good as they were last year, I don't think, but it's still Chip Kelly. The guy proves that he can win. Oh, and by the way, I'm forgetting the team that's won the last two Pac-12 championships in the Utah freaking Utes. You know, they've got their quarterback coming back. Uh, is he battling through some ACL stuff? Yeah, for sure. But that team always seems to get it done. Kyle Whittingham is probably the best non-flashy coach in college football. He goes out and gets guys that aren't supposed to be good. They're two and three star guys, and he turns them into this powerhouse. So – when I look at the Pac-12, it's going to be one of the most exciting years that they've ever had. It's the best way to go out. Now, fingers crossed that you don't cannibalize yourself and you have like four teams that end up nine and three. That's the thing that happens every year, it seems like, is there's right. a few really good, I mean, a lot of really good teams, like half the league mm-hmm. is really good and they just beat up on each other versus right. you have the SEC, I don't know exactly which divisions or uh, which conferences but certain conferences where there's like one or two guys and that's it and then they just dominate versus the pack right like they just eat themselves apart right 100 percent. well i mean like look the number one team this year georgia they've won the last two national titles they're fantastic now i think there's going to be a little bit of a chance that they get too big headed right um we've never seen a team in the modern era win a three-peat the closest team that got to that was the old reggie bush usc trojans if there's going to be a team that could do it, it's going to be this Georgia team and Kirby Smart. But I do think, you know, when you look at college football, there's a reason that people love it and they love the chaos. When you look at Georgia, they are the most complete team. They have a great offense. They have probably the best defense, if not the best of the second best defense in the country. Every other team that we can talk about, I just listed all these great things for those Pac-12 teams. They all struggle defensively, except for Utah which is the irony, Utah struggles a little bit more offensively. But when you look at Oregon, their entire secondary is brand new. USC, I bet the over in every USC game this year already. That's just a mandatory bet for me because they're (laughs) going to score 50 points, but they're going to give up another 30. San Jose State has no business scoring 28 on them, but they did, right? So when you look at those teams, that's where their issues are. When you look at Michigan in the Big Ten, They're built to dominate Ohio State, but they're not built to keep up with some of those SEC teams or the teams that play that smash mouth football. They do it at a better level. Ohio State, they can keep up with some of those SEC teams, but they're not necessarily built to beat Michigan because Michigan's going to punch them in the mouth. So it seems like right now you can pencil in Georgia into that playoff, but I'd make an argument that there are three or four teams from every single conference that have legit claim to say right now, if things go our way and we stay healthy, we're going to get into the playoffs because we have these strengths that are here, right? We just got to avoid our one big weakness. There's just too many teams right now in college football built like the Death Star. There's the air vent. (laughs) Will someone shoot through it multiple times? (laughs) Man. Yeah, that's quite the rundown. You obviously know you're – 
your college football. Do you know that just as much with NFL? Too excited. Yes, dude. Yes. I, I love football, man. It's, um, I got to play as long as I did. And you know what? Like it, it, it was a D2 career. So we're, we don't need to pretend like uh, I was a, <laughs> I was a household name or anything like that. But the reason I got to play as far as I did is because of this passion for the game and because I know the game. I, you yeah. know, I, I was strong, but I wasn't the strongest. Definitely wasn't the fastest. Definitely wasn't the most athletic. And so it, it's knowing and understanding the game and understanding the passion for it to, uh, to get it better. So, um, dude, I, I love football. Uh, I'm lucky enough that with 1080, I get to do a lot of the, the Ducks games and I get to do a lot of their post game stuff, but don't, don't get it twisted. I'd be parked on my couch from nine o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night, no matter what on a Saturday, like oh, yeah. I do, I'd, I'd get the treadmill out and like run while I watch so that I can just pretend that I was being healthy. So then I'd go order like 50 wings and eat them all to myself. So yeah, kind of buffalo dip, yeah. <laughs> right, dude. Right. You don't get it twisted. This is <laughs> you you've entered my my Super Bowl. The difference is my Super Bowl goes from, you know, the end of August, beginning of September, all the way until the actual Super Bowl. Yeah. And you got Saturdays and Sundays all all day. Thursdays, right. Mondays. <laughs> It's not football season. It's Will Ortner season. That's yeah, what go. it is. <laughs> How many uh, fantasy football leagues are you in this year? Uh, right now, I think three. Okay. Yeah. Same. <laughs> I think it. I think it's three. I've got. I've got one with the high school guys. I've got one with the college guys, and then uh, I've got one with like a, a combo of some high school core guys and some uh, some college core guys that just all happen to be from the same area. But uh, it don't be shocked if it ends up being four or five or don't be shocked. If you catch yeah. me out at the a and a sports book, watching <laughs> yeah. uh, multiple NFL Sundays and college football Saturdays. I'll be right there next to you. <laughs> Dude. It it's like no free ads, but it's the best place in Southwest Washington yeah. uh, to go watch a game right now. I mean, it's, it's got the joys of like a, a sports bar or a Buffalo wild wings where you have every game all up in front of you. Uh, with the fun of some responsible uh, sports gambling, <laughs> which I, uh, I I love to partake in from time to time. I've already got money going, dude. I've got I've got Utah minus four and a half tomorrow. So okay, hopefully they can uh, they can beat the Gators. Awesome. Well, uh, well, re really appreciate your time coming on again. Uh, if you don't already follow him, make sure to go follow Will at Will Ortner on Twitter. All yes, things sir. betting, you know, football, you name it. He's your guy. So yes, sir, man. Thanks I, again. I appreciate it. Dude, yeah. I love it. I love coming on, man. I appreciate it. Love talking M's love talking even a little bit of college football with you, Connor. Appreciate That's you for right. having me.